Welcome to each and every one of you to another video on the Ashen Chevalier. In this one, we'll be going through Charles the Cold Steel 2's Act 2, The Awakening Lions, where Class 7 begin to find their place in this war and how they should conduct themselves. With that, let's go into the pits of Gehenna. Finally reunited with his friends on the Courageous, Toa and George also join the company. Soon after, they sit down in the conference room to discuss any information they have gathered across the group and to decide on next steps. Prince Oliver explains that the Courageous started its independent operation just before Heimdall's occupation. He knew what the Alliance were planning, so gathered a skeleton crew, met with Viscount Arsaid and made for Trista, where they found the rest of Class 7 battling the Azure Knight. Once they had shaken off the Azure Knight, they began travelling around the country preparing to take everyone on board. Noticeably, Major Vanda is not present, usually joined by the hip to Oliver. Turns out he's heading up the 7th Armoured Division in Western Erebonia alongside Major Lightheart too. Eustace points out that with the Noble Alliance's leader Duke Cayenne's Le Maire present in the West, the fighting is undoubtedly more demanding, there's no wonder such forces have been sent to lead. Now, the thing is, Class 7 acknowledged the western side could fall at any time, however, the Imperial Army isn't stupid either. They must be putting up a good fight by themselves. That said, Oliver doesn't quite know which direction to pursue, so the question is, with the whole empire in the throes of civil war, what exactly do all of Class 7 intend to do from here on out? Having previously been able to speak about this, Class 7 quickly decide that although they have personal endeavours also, they will do everything they can to help push Erebonia in the right direction. Knowing that they are just kids, they can't fight a full out war against a noble alliance, but they can help steer the country by achieving smaller things. Prince Oliver is excited by the conviction shown by Class 7 and passes it on to Viscount Arsaid. Class 7 is handed the Courageous, Toa is selected as captain, naturally, and they are given full rights to use the ship as they see fit. Of course, Oliver and Vicon Arsaid will disembark in Lagram and head to Western Erebonia and to help where they can. Princess Alphen will stay on board as a representative of the Imperial family. This will help guarantee the legitimacy of their actions within Eastern Erebonia. Sharon, Toval and Claire also leave with Oliver and the Viscount. It's revealed that Chancellor Osborne was also a Thor's graduate. Oliver comments that they may have had their differences, though he still feels a certain loss with his passing. The Viscount had never had the chance to get to know him, but he doesn't doubt that he was one of the greatest men of their time. Captain Clare received a strange report about his body. She was told it was taken into the custody of the Imperial Guardsmen when the city was occupied, however, after that, it disappeared. This seems awfully familiar to the Lance Maiden's sudden death following the War of the Lions. Oliver is impressed by how much trouble one man can cause even from beyond the grave. It's likely that his many plots wouldn't be stopped even by his death. The previous day in the conference room, the group decide what they wish to achieve going forward. Elisa highlights that the Courageous gives them the ability to fly around the whole country with ease, but of course the Noble Alliance has presence in most of Erebonia, so they can't go anywhere they want. Sarah will be taking more of a back seat. After all, she reminds them that the Courageous wasn't given to her, but to the students of Class 7. Toa suggests that they think about the what and the how in terms of their next steps. If they decide on a specific thing, it will be easier to establish how to achieve it. Reen asks about Trista Academy, and George tells him a lot of the students were able to flee Trista and are now scattered across the country. The upperclassmen being nobles have no reason to fear the Alliance, so they have remained in the Academy grounds. Reen considers their what to be taking back the academy, of course the whole of class 7 agree that this is the best goal for their current position. Toa suggests that they keep an eye out for any fellow classmates since they'll be flying around most of eastern Erebonia, and with that, they decided the how. While searching for fellow classmates, they will also work to take back the academy. Back to the present day, it's time to tour the Courageous and see what facilities it has to offer. The fifth floor, well, that's where the bridge is, nothing to see here, let's move on. On the fourth floor, we have the Royal Room, where Princess Alfin is staying, a conference room, and three training rooms for close combat, ranged combat, and arts capabilities. After chatting with Princess Alfin, we check out the third floor. Here we have shops, a rest stop, and access to both the front and the rear decks. On the second floor, there is a kitchen, an infirmary, and a game room. Finally, the first floor has the Orbal Factory, a storage area for Valimar, and the Orbal Bike. 
As Valamar and Reen have been able to sync more, Reen acquires the ability Spirit Unification, which boosts his power significantly, but temporarily. Now that the tour is done, let's get to exploring where we can and go finding those Thor's classmates. First off, in Gorelia Fortress's Proving Ground, where we find Monica hanging out in the shop. Laura is able to convince her to join the Courageous. We also bump into Rex, however, he doesn't join the team. Speaking with Lieutenant Craig the Red, we find out that a man has gone missing due to wandering around by himself. Reen's group speak to a few people around the area to find out if anyone has seen him, and it turns out he was heading in the direction of the fortress. They find Anton staring at the massive hole that was caused before the war broke out, and he seems to have lost his friend Ricky again. After escorting him back to the Proving Ground, they head down Gorelia By Road, where they bump into Emily and Nicholas. The two of them are setting up relay devices across the by road to boost communications for everyone. Class 7 agrees to help them out if it gets them on board the Courageous, and so they do. Back in Legrand, Vivi is hanging inside the chapel. Vivi is feeling pretty low since she lost her sister Lind, whilst escaping the war and hasn't heard from her since. She even watered the plants more in hope that it would help, but it didn't. Fee perks up to tell her that this isn't like her and she shouldn't be acting this way. Vivi is a go-getter, full of energy and does what she wants, so her waiting around for someone to help her find Lind isn't like her. This lifts her spirit and she agrees that she should be the one to find her sister and joining the Courageous is a sure step forward. Casper is also chilling in the training hall, when speaking to him first, he chooses to stay here since he is concerned about his family on the coast of Western Erebonia. Reen takes the initiative to read the latest Imperial Chronicle, which reveals the fighting began near the coast, however, most of it occurred farther inland. Casper is pleased to hear this and realises he has no reason to worry at the moment, so he joins on board the Courageous. Cargo is in the tavern by himself, waiting for Pateri to arrive. They were running away during the war breakout, and Pateri pulled out a map pointing to where Legram was and told him to meet there. Well, actually, Machias realises that they were on opposite sides of the map, where Pateri pointed and said, here, so it's likely that she meant somewhere other than Legram. Over in Amir, they find Pateri and reunite her with Cargo. Of course, Pateri goes for the ultra headlock as a punishment for not listening. Next up is the Imperial Watchtower in Nord, where Mint is. She has lost something super important and wants to find it before joining the group on the Courageous. More than one head is always better, so Reen and Co run around the tower searching for this item. At the top of the tower, they see a glint on the roof's antenna. Success! After returning the watch to Mint, she agrees to join them, and that means we can go find someone else now. Clara is around the ancient quarry in, and is looking to create a new piece of art. However, she needs to find stone. She wants some high quality stone that is rumoured to be in the quarry itself, and so Reen heads inside. Upon reaching the end, the giant spider thing jumps out at them ready for a fight. Finally taking it down, they are able to find the stone Clara referred to. Once on board, Clara sets up in the hold and introduces us to EX stones, which help power up Valamar. Basically, stat boosting quartz for Valamar. After taking care of the Magic Knight in Nord, Toa calls Reen and lets him know that they found a relative of Class 7, Elliot's sister, Fiona. Back on the Courageous, it's revealed that she was moved from Heimdall to the Twin Dragons Bridge against her will yesterday. This is an act of the Croats and Provincial Army themselves, the Noble Alliance doesn't appear to have anything to do with it. Yusuf suspects that it might be his dad acting foolishly yet again, and steals to stop him. Everyone gathers in the conference room to find the best way to rescue Fiona Craig. Eventually, it is decided that the attack would begin from the Twin Dragons Bridge west side, using Valamar to break through the rear side's defence. While taking advantage of the confusion, a select team would then infiltrate the fortress and perform the actual rescue. The next day, the team gather on the bridge and get ready for the mission. It's highly likely that they will run into Jaegers, and for some reason, Sarah seems a little on edge about that. Over on the Twin Dragons Bridge, Lieutenant General Craig and the 4th Armoured Division confront the Provincial Army and their soldats. The Provincial Army is surprised that they would dare approach the bridge as they have Fiona hostage. Lieutenant General Craig reminds them that Fiona is the proud daughter of a military officer, and she knows exactly what comes with that. She would never give in to their cowardice. The Provincial Army is soon cut off by Princess Alfin's voice from the Courageous. She demands that they stop and that they should be ashamed of themselves taking a family member hostage using them as tools of war is unforgivable. As Princess of the Arna family, she will not allow it. 
As soon as Class 7 land on the bridge, they are met by soldats. Reen takes them down and they venture into the bridge. The hooded man who helped them through the train tracks previously appears to be watching their movements, glad that they made it inside and referring to putting some insurance in place anyways. Any idea who it is yet? Once at the top floor, Class 7 bust in to save the day, I mean Fiona. Although Fiona seems happy to see them, the provincial army soldier puts a blade to her neck reminding her and Class 7 of the situation. He goes ahead and calls in some military beasts, disguised at Dovins, to do his bidding for him. Just about getting through them, the soldier calls in more beasts. Nightheart appears, taking down all beasts and shunning the soldier away. Finally, Fiona and Elia are able to reunite, and they are both thankful that the other is well. Outside, Nightheart explains that he was away getting in contact in with the other divisions and got word that Fiona had been moved here, so he hurried over in record time. Fiona points out how sweet that is, and Class 7 are confused about their behaviour. Continuing on, he points out that he received some guidance from a rather peculiar source, giving him a way to sneak in undetected. Sound familiar? Maybe that same suspicious hooded man. Unfortunately, no one is sure who that man could be. The group decide to check in on Keldic as the Noble Alliance has been pushed back out of Trista. Becky is in one of the houses, is feeling a lot better. Reen asks if she is ready to join them and the Courageous, and the answer is yes, as she speeds off to get her shop set up on the ship. Soon after, when attempting to board the Courageous, Reen is approached by the hooded man who knows Reen's name. Finally revealing his identity, the hood comes off and... Ta-da! It's Instructor Thomas. Reen is surprised at this reveal and wonders why he was even in disguise in the first place. Thomas explains that as a Thor's instructor, he wanted to ensure that he didn't attract any unwanted attention, but now there is no need to hide himself. On the Courageous, Class 7 take the other students and instructor Thomas aboard. What could this bizarre character ever offer them? He seems a little airheaded, right? First order of business is to take care of the cryptid in Lunaria Nature Park, another in North Highlands, and then we're off to a myth. Some of the workers at the hot springs feel like they were being watched on a number of occasions, however, each time they check the direction from where the stairs came from, nothing's there except for some fresh footprints, even though no one or nothing was visibly there. The group agree that they should guard the outdoor baths and monitor what happens. They decide to take shifts, starting with the boys. The girls eventually switch in, and whilst bathing, they notice a few footprints and hear the sheep monsters that are lingering around. Reen quickly rushes in, and... Laura and Pri tell him to ready his blade and that he is in for it now. <laughs> Sarah suggests the punishment waits until later and they focus on the monsters first. The chase is on as we travel down the snowboarding path, finally catching them towards the end where the big daddy sheep appears. Commence battle! After subduing them, the sheep are warned to never appear again and scutter off into the distance. Phew. Back in the Phoenix Wings, the maiden and owner are glad that this has been resolved. Reem points out that they can rest easy now, but the girls haven't forgotten Reem's thoughtless rushing earlier. Better brace himself for a beating. Other side quests include helping Monk find a super special golden sticker related to Misty. As an avid collector, he is pretty upset that he lost it. Reen and group eventually find it and are able to return it to Monk. Next up, they travel to the Twin Dragons Bridge to meet up with Nightheart, who wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Valimar in a sold-out battle. Say no more. Post-battle, he points out that it's apparent Reen is in a rush to achieve something and that he should consider if this is something he can achieve alone and to simply continue on the present path leading him to his goal. Toa eventually calls the group back to the Courageous, where Angelica calls in. Everyone is of course glad that she is well and safe. Angie tells Elisa that she knows where her mother Arena is being held, then cuts the phone off after we hear some background gunfire. Class 7 is of course concerned about what Angie is getting herself into, and as you would expect, we're off to Raw. After handling some more side quests and recruiting more Thor students, Class 7 arrive back on the Courageous and head toward Raw. Problem is, it's heavily guarded given its proximity, and there is no clear route in. For that reason, they consult Gwyn, Elisa's grandfather, as he may know of a way to get in securely. Turns out that he used to fish on a little stream off Spina By Road, and that stream can be traced back to Amir. Looks like we'll be sailing down from Amir. Once they reach Rose Gates, the two provincial army soldiers become suspicious almost immediately. Not only does Elisa look familiar, one of the guards says that they kind of recognise all of them. Emma gets ready to use the same trick as before. The other guard tells him all kids look the same and he's probably just mistaken them for some people at the bar or something. 
Besides, they are looking for the Imperial Army, not team tour groups. How much trouble could they really cause? <laughs> Inside a mirror, we find Hugo and Lynn before approaching Reinford headquarters where Angelica's uncle Heidel Rogner appears in a car. He is the leader of the first factory. He mentions that he will be on the 24th floor waiting for his tea, which happens to be Elisa's home. It feels as though he has not only taken the company but is also trampling on their personal lives too. Time to look elsewhere for clues on the whereabouts of Angelica and Elisa's mother Arena. Over at Raw Cathedral, they see a sister, with a familiar voice, leaving as we enter. In one of the houses, they meet instructor Mary, who has been staying at Mint's house since fleeing Trista. She reminds them not to put themselves in any dangerous situations. After wandering around a little more, it becomes clear that the army's presence is making it pretty difficult for the group to find any useful information. Soon after, Yuna, one of Elisa's friends, gives her a call and asks her to come to the diner. But how did she know they were back in Roy in the first place? In the diner, they meet the same sister from the cathedral. Bit of a strange place for a sister to be, am I right? It's soon revealed that this sister is one of the people you would never imagine being a sister. It's Angelica. They sit down to learn more about the situation surrounding Raw. Angelica tells them, surprising as it may be, her father feels somewhat guilty about the occupation of Heimdall. Seems like the Nobel Alliance is not totally united from within. They got into an argument before she left home, and he shouted, If you're so damn sure you're right, prove it to me with brute force. Elisa figures if he will listen that way, maybe he has his doubts about what the Alliance is doing, to which Angelica agrees. She goes on to ask the group to leave it to her to handle, as it is a Rogner family issue, and not something that they can help with. Elisa reminds her that Ruhr and the Rhineford company are both involved. That has everything to do with Elisa. Angelica wants to settle things with her father with her own hands and she wants to rescue her mother with hers. The rest of the group acknowledge the help provided by both Elisa's mother and Angelica herself, therefore they would like to help as well. Angelica accepts Class 7's help and missions start. They all contact Toa first. George immediately questions what she is wearing and Angelica points out she makes a hot sister with a wink of course. Reen quickly re-rails the conversation, stating that they will help with her plan, which should help free Ruhr. Toa asks where the chairman is, and Angelica tells them that she is in the Saxon's iron mine, well, actually on board the Eisengraf, which is stopped in its freight station. Seems like the plan all makes sense, so to review, first go to Saxon's iron mine and free Arena. Second, rescue Reinford's company headquarters from Angelica's uncle and place him under arrest. Third, head to the Schwarzdrak barrier and settle things with her father. There's lots to do, and they don't have much time. To start, they head to the Nautia Highway, which has tight security. Not surprising, when it leads to Angelica's father. Another temple has appeared on the highway, but they'll be back to handle that later. Over on Saxon's mind, the security looks pretty sparse outside, but that makes sense since most of the Jaegers are likely guarding the Isengraf itself. After taking care of two of the Jaegers at the front, the group proceeds further in, only to face a few more on the freight platform. Once they have been taken down, one of the Jaegers orders that the Isengraf get out of here immediately, after which he passes out. The group jump on top of the moving train and make their way in through a sunlight window. On the train, they fight a few Jaeger soldiers through the different carts or carriages. I can't think of the right word right now, but you know what I mean, right? Anyway, they finally find Arena and Elisa gets complimented. Maybe? Arena tells her she didn't expect her to be so reckless, jumping atop a moving train, but she did reach her, so she earns a passing grade. Angelica rightly points out that even in captivity, Irina doesn't miss a beat. Elisa exclaims after coming this far that's all she has to say to her. Irina highlights that she shouldn't have to thank her for doing something that she didn't ask her to do, but she's glad to see that Elisa's in good health. The Jaeger takes aim at Irina and tells Reen and friends to put their weapons down if they care about Irina. The orders were to capture Arena, so a few bumps and bruises won't cause any problems, as long as they just don't unalive her. The Alliance will take Reen's group and Arena into custody, arriving in Roar soon. Arena cuts him off and agrees that there is no time to be playing around. So... Sharon? It's wonderful to see you all again. It may have only been a few days since we last met, but I can scarcely stand to be parted from your side. Ow! Oh, where did you come from? All entrances to this carriage were completely sealed! <laughs> Actually, I've been inside this train since long before it departed the station. I must admit, I did have some concerns once it started moving, however. 
The wonderful Sharon swoops in and wraps the Jaegers in her threads, hanging him in the air. Of course they are wondering how Sharon could even be here considering all the entrants were completely sealed, but she explains that she was on train before it departed the train, while she did start to worry when it started moving. The group is amazed and as, as expected, I mean, it is Sharon. Finally arriving at RF's cargo station, they all exit the train only to be met by archaisms on the platform. After dispatching them, Arena suggests Rena and the others proceed to recover the building from the emergency elevator while Sharon and Arena will work to disable the security system so that there's nothing to get in their way. Over on the 23rd floor, Director Heidel is told that the Eisengraf has been stolen and Chairman Arena is on her way. He demands that they catch her right now, but Sharon keeps getting in the way. Heidel tells them to raise the alert level and security so that no one can reach the room where he is. He struggles to think of the right plan for a few moments until something seems to come to him. The scene fades out back to the lower floors where Reen is. They battle their way through the building swarming with archaisms and make their way to the 23rd floor. Hyrule greets them advising them that they should have booked an appointment to meet him. Reen jumps in and tells him that this business couldn't wait and apologises for the intrusion. Angelica gets straight to the point and tells Heidel he doesn't belong behind that desk. He took advantage of the chaos caused during the war to imprison the chairman of the Reinford group and as if that wasn't enough, took over her home as though it was his own. What kind of noble does that? Angelica makes it clear how angry she is with him and is prepared to drag him out from behind the desk if it comes to that. Heidel tells Angelica she is just like her father, letting their sense of pride get in the way of their true potential. For example, her father leads one of the four great houses and yet always sits back letting others rise above him. Angelica reminds him that she will deal with her father in her own way after arresting Heidel first. Elisa pleads with him, asking him what he wants for his cooperation. However, he refuses everything, stating that nothing will change his mind. He goes on that this nation is at war and their naive line of thinking just won't cut it anymore. Snapping his fingers, he reveals a large archaism which has the eight leads school programmed into it. Without much time to think, Wien and his friends are thrown into battle once again. Haido is surprised that they could defeat it, but he'll call all of the archaism this building to this route. Getting cut off by Arena and Sharon telling him the building's security systems are all under their control now and all archaisms in the building have been disabled. It's over for him. Seeing Arena and having been so thoroughly defeated, Heidel's tone completely changes, practically begging Arena for forgiveness. Arena compliments him on outwitting her. I mean, she did the same thing to the previous chairman, so she can't really say anything. She tells him he did the right thing, although waltzing into her family's home and making himself comfortable is something that he should be punished for. She tells Rena and friends to leave everything here to her and get on with the other thing that they have to do. Just when the courageous appears ready to commence mission, Angelica versus her father. Over on Nortia Highway, Angelica meets up with her allies with soldats and tanks at the ready, moving toward the barrier to face off against her father. Over at the barrier, a soldier reports to Marquis Rogner about Heidel being arrested and the Rhymeford building being seized. He also informs the Marquis that Angelica and others are making their way to the barrier as they speak. That good for nothing daughter. The Marquis begins making his way down, but not before running into Vulcan, who wants to contribute instead of sitting around. Marquis Rogner tells him that it has nothing to do with him or the Noble Alliance, it's between father and his daughter. After leaving, Vulcan makes it clear that he will be getting involved some way or another, despite it being a family dispute. Back at the gates, the Marquis emerges in his soldier, commending Angelica for getting this far. However, he will not let success get to her head any further. It's discipline time. This is exactly what Angelica had expected, a one-on-one -on -one fight. As they begin, the Marquis tells her that she needs to try harder, and so Angelica musters some more strength and breaks free of the hold, delivering a knee to the head. The Marquis will need more than raw strength to win against a Taito practitioner. The audience observes the fight as fairly equal at the moment, even though it's a family feud with robots. George acknowledges the Marquis' soldier has a lot more raw power and strength, however, it's clear that Angie has been practicing to use her Taito skills too. Angelica is knocked back and down to her knees for a moment, and after a little verbal push, she unleashes a zero impact to an unguarded Marquis Rogner, pushing him to the ground. Angelica approaches her downed father, ready for him to admit defeat. He is surprised by the technique used, but accredits it to her leaving home. 
She couldn't be less of a noble if she tried. She reminds her father that it was him that taught her that true Erebonian nobles must always be able to stand on their own two feet. Those words have stuck with her throughout all of her training. Finally admitting defeat, Angelica reaches out to help the Marquis up, but not before Vulcan jumps down with a giant Goliath soldier, pushing Angie to the ground. Despite the Marquis and soldier's words, Vulcan makes his intent clear. He wants revenge on Reen and the group from the previous encounter, and won't stop until he gets that. The soldiers are ready to attack him, however he warns them that they'll end up dead if they get in the way, pushing one back effortlessly. Reen steals himself and boards Valimar for the fight. Finally taking him down, V commends Reen being in the same class as C. It's clear that there is something wrong with the soldier as it continues to spark away. George tells Reen that the orbital engine has been put under massive strain and it could blow any minute taking the whole soldier with it. That means the operator too. Reen shouts for him to get out as quickly as he can, but Vulcan doesn't move and tells Reen that this is how he wanted it to be. Even with some regrets, he is satisfied. Reen counters with if V dies it will be all for nothing. Even still, V died a long time ago since, since Arangama was slaughtered, at least now he can be reunited with them and G too. He asks Reen to give both Scarlet and Crow the ending that they want to, and the sold up begins to pulsate before thoroughly exploding right before their eyes. The aftermath leaves everyone in utter silence before order is returned by Angelica and Marcus Rogner. Princess Alfin comes to speak with the Marquis and he announces that his provincial army shall withdraw from the alliance and play no further part in the war. Elisa's mother returned to her position as chairman of the Ryanford group and no time at all went to work reuniting the various divisions and quelling the chaos that had arisen. She finds information that the soldats were primarily being produced in the west. With this knowledge she investigates further, doing all she can to guide the war to a conclusion. Whilst the Courageous goes through maintenance in Broa, the group travel around the Liberated Broa once again. Reen visits Valimar, who happily greets him and tells him that his recovery is going rather well. It's apparent that Valimar is beginning to speak quite normally, and this has been accredited to some of his memory returning, albeit slowly. Valimar acknowledges the part of him which stores memories appears to be damaged. He has very few moments of the past, such as why he was sealed within the old schoolhouse to begin with. This includes his memory of language, thus far relying only on the preset bare minimum speech functionality. Though thanks in great part to Reen's assistant, his speech is slowly restoring itself. Reen wonders if this means his memory is also returning, to which Valimar tells him it's clouded by white noise. He can recall someone burdened by a great sadness, like Reen. Someone died right before Reen's eyes and he was powerless to stop them. The more he thinks about it, the more he realises there might have been something he could have done to stop it. That regret is like a thorn stabbing into his heart. Reen inquires if the person in Valimar's memory was able to move past their burdens, but Valimar has yet to recover those memories. He goes on to comfort Reen, telling him that the sense of regret is a natural process for a human, isn't it? He advises Reen to give thought to what he would do differently if confronted with the same situation again. He will always aid Reen where he can. Reen agrees if he can't undo the past, he can at least make sure it doesn't repeat itself. Considering how to do that is the best thing that he can do right now. Soon after, George gives Reen a call asking him to come to Royal Institute of Technology to meet Professor Schmidt, the Empire's foremost orbital researcher. There, Schmidt begins the mocking by stating that he never realised the pilot of the Ashen Knight would be just the boy. The Alliance ought to be ashamed of themselves losing to a snot-nosed brat like Reen. Jeez, that's one way to say hello thanks for your work, right? Turns out Professor Smith was the one who developed the Panzer Soldats at the request of Duke Cayenne. He used the ancient robot Audine and society's archaisms as reference points, and then designed a frame that, they, that could be mass produced, even with the Rainford Company's technological capabilities. He then went on to draw up plans for several models and oversaw the completion of a Draken prototype a few months back. Reen asks if he knew what he had done and George lets him know that there is no point. Schmidt develops whatever catches his interest without care for consequences. The railway guns in Grelia Fortress and the orbital wave jamming in device in Nord were designed by him too. Schmidt scoffs and states that an engineer who doesn't strive to satisfy his intellectual curiosity is a sad sight. Engineers just design things, it's up to the user to decide what to do with them. This is the reason George left and joined the academy initially. 
Anyway, George wants to talk about getting a new weapon made for Valamar. Schmidt is aware that Reen wants a weapon to fight on par with the Azure Knight and he can make one provided that they can find some Zemurian ore. He also tells us that while developing the soul darts, he realised the frames of the Divine Knights are made up using that same ore, as well as Ordine's double saber. The concept of a weapon that can compete against Divine Knights is of great interest to him. Schmidt has no remorse for creating the soul darts though, in fact, the very thought of it makes him ill. Moving on, he promises as an engineer if Reen can find enough Sumerian ore, he will forge the most incredible touchy they have ever laid their eyes on. Back on the Courageous, Angelica has taken the helm given that she has experience with vehicles. It's great that they were able to liberate Raw and reduce the Alliance's power since Nortia's provincial army will no longer take part. Even so, Western Erebonia is still largely dominated by the Noble Alliance with General Le Guin and Brigadier General Bardius claiming victory after victory. And then there's Rufus, the brilliant leader, no doubt, and it shows. Alfin reminds them that they were charged with Eastern Erebonia and shouldn't fret over things that are not within their control. Before deciding on next steps, Machias asks about Valamar's potential new weapon. The trouble is finding the Zemurian ore in the quantity needed. Since it's related to the Divine Knights, the group asks Emma what she knows, and unfortunately, the Hexen clan doesn't know much about the creation of the Divine Knights. Some legends passed down through the clan say that they were made during the time of the Great Collapse. Specifically, they were forged by artisans who called themselves gnomes, and used to work closely with the clan's ancestors. Somewhere down the line though, the witches and the gnomes ended up parting ways, although no one knows exactly what had happened. It doesn't seem like any of that is particularly helpful in finding the ore. However, Celine seems to know where to find enough, provided they are ready to take on some serious challenges. The ruins that appeared around the country are called spirit shrines and are built upon Septian Banes, long long ago by the gnomes to encourage the formation of massive Zemurian ore crystals. In turn, those crystals are used to create the Divine Knights. Looks like that's our best lead. After a few side quests, including Phantom Thief B, replacing one of Class 7's members temporarily, freeing a stolen airliner from Jaegers, knocking down some cryptids, the group eventually proceed to the Spirit Shrine, starting with the Terra Shrine on Gorelia Byroad. Selene opens the door to the depths of the shrine and Reen makes his way through to the Proving Ground, only to be met by a magic knight protecting the Zemurian ore. After defeating it, the group retrieves some Zemurian ore and return to the Courageous. While speaking with George, Toa runs up to them in a panic, telling them that Keldic has been set on fire by the Croatian provincial army run by Eusus' father, Duke Alborea. After checking in there, it seems that Pateri and the village chief have been injured and are currently resting. Fortunately, the Imperial Army and the RMP appear to have things in hand for the time being. On the Courageous, Thomas speaks of the War of Lions, commenting that history tells us towns were set ablaze across all the country back then too. It's unlikely that Rufus would have ha had a hand in such a heinous act. Therefore, the conclusion is that it must have been Duke Alborea's doing alone. Eustace feels remorse over this and opts to leave the group to settle things with his father alone. Although Machias attempts to help Eustace feel better, it only angers him and makes him more frustrated that this is to do with his family and so no one has a right to interfere. The rest of the group chime in making it clear that this is too much for one person to handle alone and Eustace should calm down and think this over together. The entire group resolves to arrest Duke Alborea and all of a sudden they receive a call to the airship from Rufus. He makes a point that the Noble Alliance has no affiliation with the actions carried out by Duke Alborea and should they wish to go after him, the Alliance will not interfere. So he doesn't mind if they end up finishing each other off. That said, Rufus considered his position and, well, he can't very well go and accuse his father, hence bringing it up with Class 7 instead. Eustace resolves to apprehend Duke Alborea himself, of course with the help of his friends. With little time to waste, the group contacts the RMP, Imperial Army's 4th Division, and make for Bereahard and Oryx Fort. The Provincial Army is surprised by the appearance of Craig the Red and Nightheart leading them to attack, but they are prepared to fight. The Provincial Army's leader gets a call from the southern entrance of Bereahard to report that they have been attacked by the RMP. As tanks and soldats move through the city, the citizens wonder what Duke Alborea is doing, wanting Rufus to help. Over in the mansion, the Duke gets a report that Bereha is being attacked from both sides, calling them shameless fiends. They have tried to contact the Pantagruel, but with no luck. Same for Rufus's personal airship. Regardless, he orders them to repel the intruders. A few other characters are also around. 
McBurn comments on how sad a sight the Duke is and wishes that he was where the 4th Division is. Duvili reminds him that they are not to even think of trying to fight in any of this war's major battles. They belong and should remain in the shadows, leaving others to record battles in history's pages. McBurn tells them that she is too uptight, considering she has nothing to do right now and she only just got back from Crossbell, she might as well relax. Duvili being Duvili, he tells McBurn that she isn't all that interested either, but this is work. Scarlet is just around the corner and is relieved to hear that she isn't the only one that doesn't want to be here. It would take a special kind of person to help someone who has no problem burning down their own land to the ground. She hopes that she can manage one last moment of beauty before her flame burns out completely. Over at Aurox 4, Class 7 make their appearance. Some soldiers try to make a stand despite Princess Alfin's declaration, but Reen and Valamar jump down and take them all out in one shot thanks to the new Zemurian or Reinforced Touchy. I wish we could do stuff like that, maybe in a future game or a spin-off side story, but for Divine Knights or something? I don't know. Anyway, another soldier jumps down and speeds around the place slashing Reen and then returning to its original spot. Eustace observes that they have a new soldier model, the high speed Kestrel. Scarlet challenges them to a fight and Sarah agrees that she still owes them for escaping back at Gorelia Fortress. Scarlet doesn't care and makes it clear that she doesn't care about the Alliance or the country itself. She has no reason to cling to life. C already punished the man who stole everything from her just for a railway. That is all she lived for and now that it's done, nothing else matters. That is why she is here. The Ashen Prince is the best opponent for her to fall to. Scarlet notes that the Castrol unit is built for speed and she will push it to its limits, hoping to fly it straight to hell where V and G await. Reen prepares for battle and swears that he won't make the same mistake twice, no one should so easily choose to die. Toward the end of the battle, George highlights that Scarlet has put a huge strain on her sold out's orbital engine and the same thing that happened to V will happen here. Reen refuses to allow anyone else to die so long as he has the power to save them. He and Valamar slice the soldier in half, saving the cockpit where Scarlet is. The rest of Class 7 make their way inside the fortress, whilst Reen checks on Scarlet. Valamar detects vital readings from the inside and therefore her life seems to be in no danger. Reen opens the cockpit and confirms that Scarlet is okay, exhausted, but okay. He is glad that he made it in time. Crone and Dean are also glad that she was saved in time. Crow commends Reen on his sword and also speaks with George, Toa and Angelica on their own achievements. His friends promise that he will be back on their side and Crow isn't going to complain if they actually manage to pull it off. The Northern Jaegers approach the rest of the group inside and intend to stand in their way. Sarah clearly has some affiliation with them since they know her name and progress as the Purple Lightning. While she doesn't fault them for doing what they are doing, being an instructor to these kids comes first, and Erebonia is her home now. She will show no mercy to those who wish to burn her home to the ground. Sarah promises to make right what she couldn't six years ago. Sarah is able to defeat them, but heavily exhausts herself too. Reen finally joins the group just before the Jaegers really commend Sarah on her strength. Although Sarah is ready to finish them off, the Jaegers agree that they've done enough. The battle has dragged on and there is no need to fight a wounded lioness. They complete their contracts and withdraw. Of course, now it's clear that Sarah was a Jaeger previously, a part of the Northern Jaegers until six years ago. The fight catches up to Sarah, causing her to collapse to the ground, temporarily leaving the party while she rests. Finally reaching the top floor, they are met with Duke Arborea, McBurn and Duvali. McBurn wonders where Purple Lightning is as he saw her enter the fortress with them. Reen tells him that she couldn't make it. Duke Alborea shouts about what the terrorists and Jaegers are doing. Fee tells him S was defeated and the Northern Jaegers left. Eustace informs him that the Noble Alliance has abandoned him and he has nowhere left to run so should surrender with good grace. The Duke reminds him that he is the head of the House of Alborea, the ruler of the Kreutzen province and one of the four great houses. Laura doesn't care. His status does nothing to excuse his actions. No amount of power can grant him the freedom to raise his own lands. He doesn't want to hear it though. The people of that town sat back and accepted an enemy force squatting in his territory after all. He goes on to state that this country's future is as a nation ruled by the nobility. Those shameless fools have no place in it. He cannot fathom why they don't understand. Class 7 pity him and get ready to take him down. Duvili summons two Slepners and the battle begins. 
Laura notes she seemed more tired than the last time. Divili ponders on how she'll ever be able to face her illustrious lord after disgracing herself in both Crosswell and here. Duke Alborea exclaims that Duvili will protect him, however she informs him that the mission assigned to her was to come and watch the fortress fall, not to protect him. The Duke is bewildered. They arrived with the intention of abandoning him, as ordered by Duke Kyan and Lord Rufus. Besides, Duvili's lord would never forgive his crimes, and neither can she, eventually disappearing. Some of the group wonder who her lord is, and once again, Selene seems to be in the know, but won't say. Eustace approaches his father, Duke Helmut Alborea, placing him under arrest on suspicion of arson and property damage in Keldic, as well as causing harm to the people of Kreutzen. Once in custody, Princess Alfin announces as much. The Kreutzen provincial army ceased hostilities and the battles taking place around Bereahard city came to an end. By Eustace's order, the provincial army would leave for Oryx Fall, leaving Bereahard under the 4th Armoured Division's jurisdiction for now. The Alborea mansion was placed under the RMP's charge, Duke Alborea and Scarlet were to be confined there for the time being. Stopping for the supplies, Reen and others stay in Bereahard for a little while. After taking in the beautiful view that is Alborea mansion, Reen meets Eustace in the foyer who tells him Scarlet is in the annex, so we'll go visit her. She could also sense that he'd come and wonders if he came here to hear her whine and complain about him. It's clear that she didn't want to be saved, but she doesn't have to hate him for it, but she doesn't care what happens to her. Whether she lives or dies or gets executed as a terrorist, what happens, happens. Although he doesn't like her being so flippant about it, but at least she seems more cheerful than he thought she'd be. Scarlet begins to explain her story, starting with being raised in a deeply religious family, so of course she was glad that she was able to join the church. The church is a complex organisation with plenty of division within it. The group she joined was called the Congregation for the Sacraments, the immensely skilled people who had taken on some unique missions, to put it mildly. You may know this already if you've played the Sky or Crossball games, but this is Cold Steel's reference to it. It made her happy to be recognised by people like that at, at such a young age. She didn't have any special abilities of her own, but left home, trained as hard as she could, and eventually became a squire. A squire is a kind of like knight, but she became a sister, didn't she? Naturally, Reen begins to get confused, considering from the outside the church is just priests and mass, right? Her days in Arteria came to an abrupt end though, but just before her first mission. She had heard what happened to Erebonia and came back, but she was too late. Nadia the mage suggests that Scarlet gets some more rest, as she eventually falls asleep while seeing Reen off. As Reen approaches the airship, Turbot and Angelica tell him to find his classmates and get back to the ship as soon as. It seems that something has happened in Crossbell, and it's not to do with the blue barrier surrounding the city, nor the hole blown through Gorelia Fortress. As they get closer, the blue barrier has disappeared, however, in its place is a massive 2000 arch tall azure tree. Class 7 can clearly tell that this is something otherworldly. If you've played the Crossbow games, then you know what is happening. If not, you can see that Crossbow and Erebonia games appear to overlap in the timeline, i.e. Trolls from Zero and Trolls to Azure occur around the same time as Trolls of Cold Steel 1 and 2. Over on the Pantagore, Zeno, Leo, Duvali, McBurn, Blueblanc, Vita and Crow observe the tree also. Blueblanc comments that this is the fruit of the Azure Zero project, a testament to the power of human obsession. Duvili seems happy that everything did go according to plan, of course that's what she expected with her illustrious lord lending a hand. Crow asks Vita if this is a result of the Phantasmal Blaze plan, and if the aim is to spawn something like that in Erebonia too. Vita confirms that this is the plan. Before them is a miracle born of human hands, made manifest by the Zero Child. The end of the second movement is finally nigh, and with that, the Griana stops the projection and takes off. McBurn notes that it's almost time to wrap things up and wonders if it'll go the way that she and Campanella wanted it to. Over in Heimdall's Valflame Palace, Rufus is greeted by General Le Guin and Brigadier General Bardius as he asks why they are here. Bardius makes the message clear from the get-go, questioning him about Raw and now Bereahard. The Eastern Front is collapsing and he doesn't see a reason to remain in the West any longer. Le Guin sees it differently, as long as the West remains well protected, Heimdall will not fall. Nortia and those siding with Duke Alborea could always abandon their neutrality too. 
She also asks if Rufus knows anything about the tree, considering it's causing people in the East unrest. Rufus is concerned about that too, however, all he knows is that Duke Cayenne insists that its appearance was planned and that there is nothing to fear. Bardius comments that he heard Duke Cayenne was working with some society or other. But Le Guin reminds him that it doesn't matter what is happening in the background, they are warriors, they live to fight on the battlefield. Rufus directs both to defend Heimdall, and their opponents will be the 3rd and the 4th armoured divisions in the next few days. Craig the Red and One-Eyed Zek should be enough entertainment for the two of them after all, only the best will do for the two best soldiers in the provincial army. At the same time under Valflame Palace, the scene shows an elevator with Crown Prince Cedric, Eltina and Duke Cayenne on board. Cedric asks where he is going, as he isn't aware of such a place even existed underneath the palace. Duke Cayenne tells him they are travelling to the centre of this city, no, this country, a place that governs a great power. Altina kindly reminds Cedric to watch his footing as if he were to fall off the platform, he would most assuredly go splat and die. I mean, she's not wrong, but that choice of words? Fact and point with Altina, that's what you get. As they reach the bottom, Vita awaits them and after a little chatter, they gaze upon what resides down here. Cedric seems to feel something when he looks. The Duke is excited that this is a Crimson Calamity, sealed away by Saint Soundler and Dracos 250 years ago and a fragment of the great power, the Vermilion Testarossa. Back on the Courageous, Tovel calls and tells Class 7 the tree that appeared in Crossbell is called the Azure Tree, as he heard from the Guild Branch over there. It seems like things are tense there though, no one really knows what it's for or what it can do. At least, it probably won't have any direct effect on Erebonia, that's sort of good. In a way, it's the best distraction Erebonia could ask for, considering Calvert. Class 7 think about what they can do, and ironically, that is to continue exploring spirit shines, collecting Sumerian ore, etc., as they were before. Side quests include taking care of a disturbance to the spirit veins in Lehengren Castle, holding a concert with Elia and others, and a dangerous monster on Aurat's Canyon Path. Elisa also finds her father's old watch and gets it repaired. Once repaired, she realises that beneath the clock is a picture of her mother and father on their wedding day. Elisa confronts Arena, and as usual, she is tight-lipped about most things and asks to take back the watch herself. As she waits for the elevator, she is glad that Elisa didn't realise it could be spun the other way too. As she does, the watch reveals another layer with a picture of Arena and Elisa as a baby, with the text, Our Precious Treasure. She goes on that there is always a trick to everything her husband ever gave her, and Elisa still has a long way to go if she wants to be her successor. Now back to the Zimurian Ore, over to the Arya Shrine in the North Highlands. Selene opens a Proving Grounds door, and the group descend to the depths, and once again a Magic Knight appears to protect the Zimurian Ore. This time, it's Magic Knight Heavy Ruby. After taking it down, they grab the Zimurian Ore and move on to the next one, the Aqua Shrine, off of the Ebel Highway for some more ore. After destroying the Magic Knight is for Ezreal, dude has four arms, hands and swords, but still got trashed. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Anyway, onto the Ignis Trine near Raw. Reaching the depths, they are met with the Magic Knight and all of a sudden, blades of fire appear around it and slash it to death. Grannis flutters down and Vita's image appears. Although the group are ready to fight, Vita wonders why they are so wary of her. She just did them a favour, since they were going to kill her anyway. Reen makes a point that the last favour was abducting Elise and Princess Alfin, how could they not be on guard? Vita's obviously not very popular here. Emma is confused how Vita could know of this place, and so no surprise, she is a full-fledged witch, she knows everything. Far more than a trainee like her could ever imagine. In fact, she knows more about this place than Celine and the Elder. She continues to show them the purpose of the Hexen clan, she continues to show them the purpose of the Hexen clan they belong to. Images appear showing the young man and a girl looking upon an ore crystal. The young man notes his fate was set when he first met that night. Now, will the girl stay with him until the end? The girl replies that she will stay by his side until the goddess wants her. Back to the present, the group concludes the blonde haired girl must have been, but it isn't quite revealed yet. Vita tells them that she showed them a glimpse of the truth regarding what really happened during the War of the Lions. Usually only the Ashen Awakener would be able to see it, but Vita made it possible for the whole group this time. Wien concludes that the man was definitely Drykel's Lionheart, and the woman with him was the Lance Maiden, Leanne Sandlot. 
During the war, they too had to borrow the strength of the Divine Knight and were drawn into a conflict between fragments of the Great Power, just like Reen and Crow during this war. That shouldn't be possible since there is no mention of Divine Knights in history books, however Emma has heard her grandmother talk of this. The fragments of the Great Power are destined to be drawn to one another, forced to collide over and over and over. Vita tells him these dark times Erebonia is going through have repeated themselves since time immemorial, and every time, the truth of what happened disappears from the memories of all, that is how the system works. The clan's role is to manage a part of this giant system, but of course, Emma wouldn't have known anything about that, and the Elder wouldn't have told her either. Emma is stunned at what she has learned, and wavers on her purpose. With Reen around, that doesn't last long. He and the rest of the class pump up the emotions, making it clear to Emma that no matter what she learns about her past, they will still care for her the same for all the time that they have spent together. Emma tells Vita she is no longer the person she used to be. She wishes to follow her own path from now on, despite previously following her duties blindly. Vita is relieved at this change in emotion, and pours some of her mana into her familiar, morphing into Griana's aura, the Azure Guardian. After clipping its wings, Vita reappears and tells Emma she is glad she has found her resolve. However, resolve only gains worth when it's seen through to the end. Emma agrees that she will find a path through life on her own and she will stop her. Vita chuckles it off stating that she can't see her succeeding in that regard, but feel free to try. As she disappears, she tells them they'll see her soon at the Infernal Rite. With four Zemurian crystals in tow, George and Reen prepare the ship for Professor Schmidt to create the reinforced Tarchi for Valamar. Not quite what Schmidt had wanted, but he is satisfied given the limitations inside the ship. Of course he is also surprised that they were able to find so much ore. Nevertheless, George as a previous student of his will be assisting, but it's warned to not get in the way of Schmidt's work. Whilst the Tachi work begins, the Courageous receives a call from Captain Claire of the RMP who advises them that the Alliance has moved their line of defence around the capital westward, meaning Trista is much more exposed than before. The upper class students were chosen to defend Trista, naturally, as it would still be under the control of the nobility. The academy is being overseen by a group of students calling themselves the Order of the Lion, with its commander being one of the sons of Marcos Hyams, Patrick T. Hyams. The RMP are prepared to take back Trista and the Academy, however, Reen asks if they can hold off. After all, Class 7 and others have dreamed of getting Trista back themselves with their own hands. Princess Alvin agrees, Thor's was established by her ancestors, so it's only natural. The rest of the crew of course agree to this too, and so the responsibility lays with Class 7 and the Courageous. Claire is taken aback, commenting that they must have gone to different schools entirely because she never felt the devotion and attachment that all of them clearly possess. The RMP will wait two days. Trista will form a vital base to take Heimdall, so it needs to be liberated as soon as possible. Sarah points out that Claire should be an actress considering she was going to say yes all along. A few days later, now that the destination has been agreed, it's time to go over the plan of attack. The majority of the Alliance forces that were there have been withdrawn, but some still remain defending the town's east side. With Soldat stationed there, it's likely the moment they approach Trista they will come under attack. Hence Reen and Valamar will deal with them first, to clear a path for everyone else. Following that, they will escort Toa into the academy and let her work her magic. As they approach, they are attacked by a long-range orbital cannon from a Goliath Soldat. Reen is able to cut through them both, leaving them bewildered. The rest of the army withdraw to Heimdall. Finally able to visit Trista again, Class 7 and the others notice that it's rather quiet, like a ghost town. The group reminisce outside of the dorms, of course, it would be nice if Sharon and Crow were with them. Mick notices them and is glad to have them in town again, everyone else from town gathered to hype them up more. Mick heard from Tovel that they'd be here to liberate Trista soon and that they should give Class 7 a warm welcome. From classmates to friends, this is the first time that they've been back in Trista since the Alliance took the capital. It's only been two months, but it feels like it's been so much longer. As they proceed to the entrance grounds of Thor's Military Academy, they are met with Patrick, Celestin, Ferris and Lambert. They were all aware that Class 7 would make their move now that the Alliance had left, and for that reason they were prepared to meet both parties at the front and back gates. For the back gate, there is Vincent, Edel, Friedel and, Sif and Serifa. Who are, prepared, who are prepared to stop Angelica's party. Reen's opposition gets back already, and when he asks if they really have to fight, 
Patrick points out that they wouldn't be much of an order if they just let them waltz through. While Reen agrees to an extent, the Alliance forces who gave them that task are long gone. They are all students here, why do they need to continue to fight? Patrick makes it clear that they aren't doing this because they were ordered to, but because they are upper class students. Neither the will of the Alliance nor his father's desires are of concern to him. They wish to find their cause to fight for by virtue of that pride and honour. Once both fights are over, Reen's group quickly celebrate their win. After some words between the two groups, Instructor Makarov and Principal Van Dyke comes out from the door, explaining they were asked to observe the fight from inside and they are pleasantly surprised by all of their performances. It turns out that once the Alliance had withdrawn, Patrick and the other upper class students released the instructors almost immediately, but asked them to stay inside of the building out of sight. Beatrix and Vice Principal Heinrich observed the other battle too. Soon after, Sarah, Thomas and George join and now everyone is in one place. Principal Van Dyke approaches Patrick and asks him what he wishes to do considering the Battle of the Bulls has been fought and the victor is Claire. Patrick is unsure how to answer when Reen walks up to him and puts his hand out to help him up again. Patrick questions him reminding him of what happened the last time and Reen tells him that this is the first time that they have fought without holding anything back and the first time they regarded each other as equals. Maybe he couldn't take his hand after the last fight but this time it's different. Patrick takes Reen's hand, gets back up on his feet and proclaims that the Order of the Lion is disbanded from here on. All upper class students will now be led by the student council president Herschel. Now every student regardless of class shall fight under one banner as bearers of the horned lion crest. Everyone rejoices and finally class 7 have taken back their home, Thor's military academy. Now it's time to take back their happiness and thus act 2 the awakening lions comes to a close. Thank you everyone for watching, if you haven't already please like, subscribe and comment as there will be more videos coming up soon. Thanks again for the support, I'll see you on the next one. I hope you all have a beautiful day, night, wherever you are and don't forget to continue moving forward relentlessly without looking back. Peace.